Okay, so welcome to intern and newcomer lightning talks. So these are lightning talks by our Google Summer of Code uh, interns, and we have at least one talk from a newcomer to GNOME. Each talk's going to be five minutes long. Uh, no questions, if you have any questions, come find the intern afterwards. Okay, so first up we have Kai. My name is Kai, I'm a student in Berlin, and I will shortly present my project. Um, so, but first, what is GNOME Disk? GNOME Disk is an application to, um, and maybe some of you have used it already, <laughs> that's how it looks like in the current state. Uh, it's an application to view, modify, and configure storage devices. Uh, and you might also use it from GNOME files to format a device or mount an image. And um, sometimes um, if bad things happen, it also provides uh, notifications for um, the smartest health state of your hard, uh, hard drive. How does uh, GNOME disk work? It is um, actually the UDIS daemon which does the device management and GNOME disk displays these devices and the jobs which are running and can start new actions on these devices. And um, yeah, of course the DM is not to require too much detail knowledge to do this from the user. And my GSOC project is to um, add support for resize and repairing uh, file systems. And the motivation why I proposed this was because um, Departed doesn't work in Wayland because it's, it's a root program and it can't show all the, these devices which UDIS knows. And UDIS um, has the advantage that it can uh, allow non-users to manage their devices without the root password. And um, yeah, so I looked for a mentor. It was um, then Andre Holy from uh, Czech. He um, was working at Red Hat and yeah, he stepped in and made it possible. That's very nice for me <laughs> and uh, I learned a lot. So I first started to implement support for um, all these three things in uh, UDIS. And recently UDIS transitioned to uh, use a library called the Clip Doctest, uh, where some of these parts were already present and others were uh, missing. So um, yeah, first I wanted to make UDIS aware of the installed uh, toolchain. And I implemented the missing parts uh, and chained it together as Devos. API. So it looks like this right now, if you want to confirm that you really uh, start the repair action, which might be destructive, of course. And uh, resize looks like that currently over partition. And yeah, so the outcome is uh, at least for X4 and XFS part parts that is supported. Um, and yeah, the required tooling is. Um, tested and um, yeah, I had to decide that first we only su support it for um, partitions because you can rearrange the size then in the of the partition but not for example in a Lux encrypted partition where it's currently not possible to actually resize the whole thing. And yeah, also progress is uh, <laughs> missing and NTFS is also not supported right now. Related work was that I, uh, yeah, redesigned with Ellen the um, format dialog and implemented it. Um, yeah, the hard question is which file system should be default, what should be sele selectable, and so on. Um, and yeah, then there were some old mockups which uh, are now revived, and um, yeah, it would be nice if package kit could be used to install the missing tooling. And this is how it could look like the next UI for you, uh, GNOME Disk. Um, yeah, this is the new format dialog, which is uh, offering the defaults. And then, in addition, I try to find a solution to support uh, other use cases where people say, like, I really want to have U UDF or I want to have um, whatever, better FS, and so on. And you can't show it directly up front. <laughs> and yeah, so I tried maybe easier to have a custom format page than in this format dialog. Thank you.
Okay, Ludvico, you're up next. Hi, I'm uh, Ludvico Nikis, and uh, my mentor is uh, Tobias Müller, and my commentor Andrei Makavei. And for uh, this uh, sum of code, I'm working on uh, GNOME Keysign. Uh, GNOME Keysign is a program for sign uh, PGP keys in a simple way. Um, right now, uh, the key transfer uh, uses uh, an uh, Avaki server, and um, uh, the uh, limitation uh, is that uh, there are some uh, use cases uh, not uh, covered. Uh, um, for example, if uh, two users uh, has uh, an internet access, but uh, they are in uh, an isolated uh, LAN, for example, uh, the uh, some uh, open uh, Wi-Fi network, uh, they cannot transfer uh, their keys. Um, to avoid this, uh, um, uh, I added the magic wormhole uh, to Keysign, and uh, this uh, allow us to um, transfer the keys uh, also um, if uh, two users are in uh, isolated LAN or uh, even uh, remotely. And uh, in short, uh, Magic Wormhole uh, uh, generate uh, a code that is uh, composed of uh, one uh, number, uh, that is the channel uh, of the um, of the connection, and the two English word uh, picked uh, from uh, the o uh, PGP word list. And um, this is uh, how the sending uh, tab. Uh, Looks like uh, it's uh, the exactly the same uh, as uh, before, and uh, with uh, an extra internet uh, toggle button uh, in the top bar. Um, and if the user toggle it, uh, he can uh, he will uh, transfer the keys uh, using uh, magic wormhole. Um, this is the sending uh, uh, page uh, with uh, the security code. Uh, um, right now there is the uh, wormhole code instead of uh, the Avaki wormhole, uh, Avaki code. Um, the receiving uh, tab, um, there is uh, no extra buttons and the user uh, can um, only input the code and uh, the program will uh, check uh, if the code is uh, an uh, Avaki code or a uh, uh, wormhole code automatically. Um, right now it uh, works, um, is in a pull request and uh, I'm uh, voltating if the code needs a smaller factor, uh, for example, uh, for the uh, asynchronous part and uh, other small things. Um, as an extra uh, transfer method, I added the Bluetooth, and uh, with it uh, we can uh, transfer uh, exchange keys uh, even uh, with uh, no uh, LAN or WAN connection. And we can uh, transfer with Bluetooth, uh, uh, changing the name uh, of the Bluetooth uh, to the key sign, uh, uh, key fingerprint that we want to sign or alternatively we can uh, directly use the Bluetooth MAC address uh, uh, as the code uh, to use. Um, okay, um, the right now I implemented the booth and uh, we still need to uh, know, to check uh, which one is better. And uh, right now Bluetooth uh, works, there are still things to do and uh, like about data or presenting the Bluetooth option or better error handling and security if we want to uh, need uh, a pairing or not uh, and uh, how to uh, secure the connection. And uh, I end uh, with this. Uh, and this is uh, uh, about uh, signing keys. Uh, so remember that uh, signing is an important thing even if you are in a key signing party or uh, 
remotely connected, uh, also always double check the key that you are going to sign. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. So hi, my name's Lucy, and a part of Google Summer of Code, I'm working on the builder with my mentor Christian, and I'm creating the documentation cards, uh, which are these little windows that will give you some extra information about the functions. If you're a new user and you need the information, or just if you want to check some details. Uh, this is how it looks. Uh, it's very easy to use. It works on Hoover. So you just hoover over whatever you want the documentation for. It will give you the parameters of the function and the returning value. If you, if you need more information, you just click the show more. And more information will reveal those the text description of the function, maybe the code example. Uh, description of the parameters. Uh, this information is actually from DevHelp, so it's the same information you would find on the GNOME website. Uh, and as of right now, DevHelp is just one of the providers, so maybe in the future, um, different providers of documentation can be uh, used there. Uh, on the other side, not only the documentation cards uh, can use the information uh, if you want to make a feature that you think it could use that information, you can just simply get it using this. Uh, for example, right now I'm creating uh, for auto completion uh, to get more information about the each function when you're selecting it. So this is pretty much it, what I did so far. Uh, thank you for attention. Hello everyone, I'm Ernestas Kalik, and this summer I'm working on Attilas as part of Google Summer of Code under the mentorship of Carlos Soriano. <laughs> okay. Uh, so th the problem is that uh, GTask does not do much in terms of rate limiting for us. Uh, so many I.O. operations are unbounded and can result in lower performance. So we need to do that ourselves at the application layer. And my solution is to take GTask and make it very simple and split it into two parts, which is Nautilus Task, uh, the worker, and Nautilus Task Manager, the executor. Uh, the executor in this case has complete control over the underlying thread pool, and we can limit the number of active threads at any time. Uh, but the problem is here that the code base itself is very tightly coupled. Uh, and it makes it hard to implement big changes throughout the code base. So Carlos and I agreed to re-implement some, some of the more basic stuff uh, to, help, to help me build this thing easier. And so this is unrelated, but many, thing, many people complain that the user interface of Nautilus is going a lot simpler each release, so I took it upon myself to make it even simpler for them to enjoy. Uh, my future goals this summer are to port more operations to the new API. So we would have a completely operational file manager. Then what I should do is write unit tests to make sure that the thing does not collapse. And then we merge whenever that is. So thank you. Well, thank you.
Hello everyone, uh, I'm Rohit Kaushik and I'm working on Todoist integration in GNOME Todo. My mentor is uh, Georges Basile. So uh, Todoist is a uh, project management application. You can create tasks, uh, assign due dates to it, and also prior prioritize it. So uh, it is basically very similar to uh, the project GNOME Todo. So the reason uh, we chose to integrate Todoist was it is very popular and widely used. Secondly, uh, it provides uh, features like production graphs and email uh, notifications that can uh, help you manage your work more efficiently. Further, uh, it fits well with the GNOME apps like Todo and Recipe. So the first task in implementation was uh, implementing a Todoist provider inside uh, GNOME online accounts, which was done by the recipe teams. And I worked on uh, adding functions that can help other applications to open a portal uh, through which a user can uh, log into their Todoist account. The second part was uh, implementing a preferences panel uh, inside the Todo, uh, which will allow you to manage your uh, Todoist accounts and you can uh, create, uh, add new to Todoist account or delete it. So for making the uh, HTTP uh, re request, we uh, I'm using the Librest API because uh, the functions were very easy, easier than the uh, Libsub API. So uh, we decided to go with Librest. The last part is uh, implementing Todoist provider class. This, act this actually works uh, and uh, it has functions that would send the post request and uh, update all your local changes to the Todoist account. So this is basically how the plugin works. First, uh, when you switch on the plugin, all the Todoist account is fetched from the Goa. Then a Todoist provider is uh, uh, assigned to every Todoist account, which does all the rest of the work for sending post requests and creating tasks and every other local changes. So this is how the preferences panel look. On the right side, uh, it shows the uh, all the accounts that uh, there are for the Todoist and. If you don't have any uh, Todoist account already loaded inside Goa, the left image is shown. Oh, sorry. So further work is queuing the HTTP post request because there's a limit on the number of uh, post requests we can send to Todoist. Uh, so the limit is actually 50 for every minute. So uh, we decided to queue all the HTTP post requests and dispatch it after every few minutes. The other work that remains is command compression. So the Todoist API allows you to send more than uh, 100, uh, allows you oh, oh, only 100 commands per request. So we can actually compress all the commands and uh, send it with a single post request. The last part is, uh, automatic sync every one hour. So after every one hour, your whatever changes uh, inside your Todoist account is done, it gets automatically synced with your GNOME Todo. OK, thank you. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julius. I'm f a student from Würzburg in Germany, and uh, I worked uh, during this Google Summer of Code project uh, together with GNOME and Nextcloud. Uh, Nextcloud, for those of you who don't know, is uh, an open source cloud provider uh, uh, solution that offers file synchronization and calendar and contact synchronization and stuff like that. So it was really great that GNOME was open uh, to do work together on this. Um, yeah, why is this even needed? Uh, we basically need a way to access the synced folders and, and, and files we have in our cloud providers like Nextcloud or Dropbox or 
yeah, all of those. And basically every uh, user just interacts with the files on the file manager, of course. And uh, those cloud providers always offer the sync clients. Uh, but there's, yeah, the main problem is that uh, they all put this uh, little status icons uh, in the top bar and you don't uh, use the cloud providers where you should, which is in the file manager. So the goal was to provide an API where sync clients can expose their functionality to other applications like Nautilus, for example. Uh, this is what we came up with. Uh, Carlos, my mentor, did uh, uh, work in yeah work in progress implementation like in two years ago. Uh, this is what I uh, started with and extended it a little bit. So uh, we have a cloud provider that can basically have an icon, have a name, have a path of a folder that it syncs, uh, syncing status, something like failed or is sync is paused. And of course, it can uh, uh, notify programs like file managers if something has changed on this. Um, yeah, this is uh, somehow what cloud providers then need to implement in Dbus, which is quite much, but uh, w uh, developers should not mess with all this Dbus stuff, so we wrote a, a little C API around that, that should uh, in the future also be using uh, the G object introspection so it can be used from other program languages like Python. So basically everything a cloud provider needs to do is just uh, co uh, yeah, create a new cloud provider object and uh, connect some signal handlers for that so it can react on uh, get name or get icon for example. And one other thing that we use is that uh, cloud providers can also export menus like G menu model. Uh, so I will show in the next slides where this is used. Uh, this is the current state in Nautilus, for example. We have uh, the for every sync folder we have uh, icon and description in the sidebar, and this is not only in Nautilus. This is uh, uh, implemented in the GTK places sidebar, so it can also be used in the file cho uh, chooser dialog and stuff like that. And this is where the menu comes in. Um, yeah, you can see that is basically what the next cloud client used to show when you right click on the status icon. And we now have all these options directly integrated in the uh, file browser. Right, uh, that is basically some Python pseudocode, what uh, is done in the GTK places sidebar to just fetch the information from the cloud provider. So it's 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 just um, iterating over a list of the cloud providers and uh, calling functions to get the status or get the name. So um, yeah, this is what we came up with in a uh, call we had at the beginning. Th these are all things cloud providers, uh, users are interacting with cloud providers and the first two uh, points are basically what we, what I already did and yeah, uh, interacting with the sync client and stuff like that. And the other points like cloud providers also offer comments, uh, favorites of files and stuff like that. And that is something that I like to discuss with people from around here. So how we can uh, integrate it further with that. Right. So that's from me, thanks so far. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alex and uh, this summer I'm uh, working again on Nautilus as part of Google Summer of Code under the mentorship of Carlos Garnacho and Carlos Soriano. But, and uh, this time I'm uh, working on improving the search. Uh, let's first start with asking ourselves a question, uh, how the search can be improved? Well, first of all, now uh, currently Nautilus doesn't use a lot of what a uh, tracker can do in a search. So uh, with Tracker, we can do things like full text search, having tags, or searching by metadata. And uh, another thing that we can do is improving the performance. For instance, uh, for the type of head use case, I think that 
the most important problem is that the search is currently too slow. For instance, if a user types something, it, it's usually press enter right after, and it won't work right now. <coughs> and another part is fixing some existing bugs. Um, for instance, uh, there is some flickering in the list view when, uh, I mean, the um, width of the columns uh, switches size a few times before stabilizing. <laughs> and uh, another bug would be that in the shell provider, when the search stops there, the shell provider in Nautilus doesn't stop. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you what I worked on so far. So until now I did the full text search and uh, what I did to achieve that is <coughs> uh, adding FTS match to the Nautilus tracker query and uh, also besides that I added FTS snippets so if a snippet is available to show the context in which the word or the words were found. So another thing, oh sorry, uh, the for full text search, uh, it can be toggled from the search popover whether you want to have full text search or just search by file name. And uh, you there is also a preference to choose what you want by default. Uh, another thing I worked on is tags, but in the end uh, we decided not to include this, but still I got to do some work on it until we decided not to include it. So this is a dialogue that I came up for testing. So for tags, I uh, wrote a tag manager, and uh, uh, this tag manager does queries, uh, tracker queries asynchronously. For instance, getting files that have a tag, getting all tags, or inserting, deleting a tag. But still, uh, not all of this work will go to waste because we decided to have uh, favorite files, <coughs> which is something similar to tags because it's like a single tag focused on a single use case. So now uh, we added a start location in the um, sidebar. And uh, <coughs> also in the list view, there is a star that can be toggled, making or unmaking the file favorites. And also the in the view, the um, files can be sorted by the favorites. I mean, the favorite files will show first if you want to, to reach them faster. Uh, so yeah, that was all. Thanks for your attention. Okay. Uh, a very good evening to everyone present here. Uh, my name is Suhas. And uh, I'm working on PTV this summer. Uh, my project is to have an API to have custom effect UI in PTV. Uh, I'm working under the mentorship of Matthew Duponchel. So uh, effects are, uh, if okay, for all of you who don't know, PTV is a video editor. And effects are one of the most important features of a video editor. Uh, uh, currently, what happens in PTV, or what previously before, my work, what happened in PTV was that the effect UI was getting auto-generated. So how that worked was uh, basically they had a GTK grid and uh, uh, they were checking the properties of, effect properties were getting checked and, uh, and the corresponding widgets were pushed onto the grid. So that led to a very uniform and very basic UI, like, uh, like as you can see here, uh, like, uh, to adjust RGB values, you're just simply asking them uh, through spin buttons and scales, which is not desirable. So phase one of my work was to, uh, to add an API uh, so that custom effect UI can be, can be allowed uh, using the internal architecture that PTV already had for handling uh, effects. Uh, so uh, uh, back in 2013, uh, Neko Hayo, uh, Jeff, he all, uh, popularly, I mean, uh, his name is Jeff. He already worked on uh, providing uh, this uh, mechanism. So I had to port his work to the current master and also improve his work uh, uh, to improve, uh, to, 
uh, my my fellow GSOCer, Cforge is working on plugins to make this API accessible uh, to to the plugins that is uh, that he's working on. Uh, the current solution is uh, to emit a signal called create widget, which plugins or any other callback can collect, connect to. And uh, uh, currently, what happens is when this is emitted, uh, you can uh, connect a callback and return your widget, which will be internally mapped using a map builder function. Uh, and uh, the second is like, uh, it, you can also have a Glade UI file with the proper names, and uh, just having that will also work. And the map builder again will map it back to the internal architecture that PTV has, and it'll make sure that the UI works. Uh, otherwise, you can always fall back to the basic UI. Um, phase two of my work, when I was designing uh, uh, example UI using this, uh, I noticed that uh, most of uh, normally what you have to do is uh, you don't have to replace everything in the auto-generated UI. You just have uh, want would like to have a few custom widgets. So that that was one of the improvements that I added to this uh, mechanism. Uh, so just to maintain consistency, you, there's a signal called create property widget. You just have to uh, connect to that, and uh, this time return uh, a dynamic widget, which is a wrapper. Uh, I would have liked to do away with this wrapper, but for now, that is one of the drawbacks of this mechanism. So this is not, uh, it's my custom widget, but not really. I'm simply learning to make custom widgets and uh, uh, seeing uh, what I can do with Cairo. And uh, so this is something that I referred, uh, and uh, I made this in use, uh, referring GIMP's uh, col uh, color wheel. Uh, so my future work is to complete the color wheel and uh, to integrate it into the first screenshot that you saw to improve that to make it better. So you can check out my work and more updates at uh, uh, on my blog. Uh, thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. So usually. What we have is this cool summer of code uh, students presenting. But there are more newcomers than only cool summer of code students. And you know that one of the rules of Google summer of code is that only coding can be done. So we have some free time, and I would like to present some of the other newcomers that are doing something that is not related to code to also present something. So here we have, we have Cassandra, which is doing something that is not related to IT, but he's still enjoying. Uh, with Nom. Hey everyone, I am Cassandra. I am not, uh, I don't have a technical background like Carlos said. I'm actually a fourth year graduate student. I'm studying clinical psychology. And when I began my program and I started learning more about psychology and mental health care, I noticed that the world of psychology is so far apart from the world of technology. And you can see that in the way that there aren't resources that can be delivered um, through computer programs. A lot of the um, patient healthcare records are still all printed out and or written by hand. Uh, there are just so many areas where technology could facilitate the growth of the field. Um, and so, for my dissertation, I'm looking into creating programs to deliver mental health care to people that would otherwise not have the um, resources that could not afford it, could not go into face-to-face -face care um, because it's not available or not accessible or for whatever reason. So the the idea is finding a way to combine the two. And so because I come from the psychology side of it, it's been hard for me to sort of get the tech side and learn about what it what I would really need to do to create these programs. So I've always been really interested in um, in technology. I did a, uh, an internship and worked part-time at Endless for a while. And that really introduced me to the world of um, Linux and GNOME and open source software. And 
I um, found that that GNOME and getting involved with, with GNOME has been the perfect way to get my foot in the door and start learning these new skills. And so one of the greatest parts of this is the community. And I have found that everyone is just so welcoming, everyone is there to help, uh, people are not judgmental, and I'm able to ask questions like, what is Flatpak, or how do I file a bug, or what is a bug, <laughs> you know? So I um, was have been able to participate in things like the November bug squash, and um, starting to edit wikis, and seeing, you know, learning these things for the first time, and being able to ask these really basic questions without being scared of being judged. Um, whereas I feel that in other communities, I would feel intimidated, or I just wouldn't really feel uh, as comfortable making, you know, asking these questions or, or revealing that I don't know what so many of these things are. So uh, it's been a really positive experience so far, just being able to learn and work with mentors around um, the engagement team. So the engagement team works with newcomers as well and uh, really helps people will find a place in GNOME where they can contribute, whether or not they have a technical background. And so through the engagement team, I've been able to find little projects like finding photos for the annual report and then slowly ramping up to um, like starting a blog and now even helping to revamp the GNOME birthday website, which will be coming either today or tomorrow. <laughs> so um, today, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. It's just been an awesome experience and wanted to share that with you all and thank everyone that has been there near, far in this, just creating such an awesome community that I can be a part of. Thanks. So we've got three more talks and we just need to swap a bit of hardware here. And after we are finished, one of the organizing team will give us more information about what we're doing this evening. All right, here we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Yash Singh. I am from India, and I am doing a uh, Google Summer of Code project on Genome Calendar, and uh, Georges is my mentor. So, um, yeah, that's my project title. I have to add support for recurring events, uh, which I think has been quite longed by the users, but yeah, it's finally here. Yeah, so some of you might be wondering what is a recurring event. A recurring ev event is just an event that repeats. So suppose you go to the gym every Wednesday, so now you can just create an event which repeats weekly on Wednesdays and that's it. It's that easy. So yeah, major components of my project. Yeah, so first we have the has recurrence uh, property, which is pretty basic. So you can see that I added this event from Google Calendar, and uh, I use GTK Inspector, so you can see that has recurrence has been set to true. So yep, yeah, that works. It was quite a simple step, but a necessary one. Then we had the recurrence dialog, so when you were editing a recurring event, it would ask you the changes as in the target of these changes. So you can make the changes to only this event, the subsequent events, or all events. And then I modified the edit dialog and added repeat options. So the first option deals with how often an event should repeat, like uh, daily, monthly, etc. And the second option deals with uh, if an event should repeat forever, or a date until it should repeat, a number of times it should repeat. So uh, let me show you a short demo of my project. So I'm going to create a new event called Guadec.
now you can see that uh, I have quite a few options here. So I'll select daily, and then I'll use number of occurrences, and I'll choose six. And as you can see, the event has been created. Oops. Yeah, uh, you can see it there. So I came to know that from 31st onwards, we're having, as in it's not the official conference, it's unconference. So let me just edit that. OK, now I'll choose subsequent events. So now you can see that the first three occurrences are unchanged. They're Guadec. And only the last three are changed to unconference. So yeah, this was a short demo. Hope you enjoyed it. And the challenges face, yeah, just a sec. Uh, challenges face in the project. So I had to use the libicar uh, uh, library, and which is like sparsely documented. So I didn't know what half the functions did, but somehow I got around working that. And uh, I relied on uh, evolution calendars code, which is not well maintained, as in it lacks comments and stuff. So it was quite difficult. And same goes for libecal docs. Yep, so these three things have been, as of now, completed. But there's some bug fixing to do. And a test, uh, test suite needs to be added. You can follow my blog if you want to stay up to date to the project. Yeah, so I would like to thank the entire genome community for giving me the opportunity to do this project and their helpful attitude because, trust me, I've la asked lots of silly questions on IRC and I've got an answer for every single question. I would like to thank the Guadec team for inviting me here and uh, my mentor, Georges, who was like the powerhouse of this project, very efficient guy, and the EDS maintainer, he was like, as in he got me out of pretty sticky situations. So yeah, I can't thank him more. Uh, so yeah, thank you. That's it. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Fabian Orcon. I'm, I'm going to talk about my project during GSOC. Uh, I have been contributing before to PTV some, since some years ago. And someday in my vacations of the university, I came up with an idea that it could be to implement a GStreamer plugin that it is, I call it to it, uh, GST Blender source that you can take as a, a Blender file as a as a source and stream it to and stream it to render it in a GStreamer pipeline. But it had many many complications with bugs from Blender and another uh, bugs in GStreamer from the Python side. So I I saw that it was not 
uh, viable desktop project. And then I find out something that was more, uh, may maybe a first step that could, could be done to, uh, to do this project that was to make a plugin system in PTB. Uh, well, that's my project. And why a plugin system? I think that uh, having a plugin system uh, is, a, is a way to uh, catch the attention of more uh, developers that want to uh, start to contribute to to PTV, and they don't also they don't need the they don't need the um, they don't need the dependency of other people in PTV like maintainers that they need to review the pat the patches and decide to uh, pull the patches upstream uh, to push the pat to push the patches upstream. Um, so I think that it's more it's easier to to implement uh, to create new features. Uh, okay, uh, the first phase of this project was to make in LibPiece work to work in in Python. It is possible actually to to make uh, plugins in, in Python with LibPiece, but it is not possible to to write a plugin manager. You can uh, you couldn't create a, the plugin manager, and the problem was basically uh, that there was a a use of the g parameter uh, function. Okay, I think it's reversed. I think, okay, the g parameter, before the g parameter uh, prototype was, uh, there was the, that, that, that is in the down part. Uh, g parameter is not introspectable in Python, so, I before the GSOC started, I I I was working on deprecating G parameter. Uh, okay, now the G parameter is uh, this problem is fixed. This uh, on the top you can see the new prototype that is done. Uh, this is a way you implement a plugin system in Python. Uh, uh, this is the plugin manager in. In PTV, you, I, I could, I could have used the plugin, um, the Lipis GTK dialog, but it doesn't fit pretty well in the, in the preference di dialog of PTV. So I did, I did that. Um, my mentor Al Alexander Valdo told me to focus on the developer console that is based on Jedi's console. Uh, it basically uh, has the same features, uh, but it adds uh, shortcuts that you can access easily, and it can, it can, it can, it can help uh, to PTV developers to make some quick experiments in the, in the program. And what's next? Uh, my mentor uh, has some reviews about my, about my code that need to be fixed. Okay. Uh, some documentation, and uh, I'm going to finish with uh, the time mark with the timeline Merkur spline that adds uh, uh, guide gu guidelines uh, each five seconds. That's all. So we have more newcomers that are not Google Summer of Code. In this case, they are designers from Endless. Um, they are experienced on their field, but they are still newcomers to GNOME. So I w I, it was interesting for me to to listen to what their experience is um, coming to GNOME with uh, already a big background um, on themselves. So welcome to Kate and Robin. Hi everyone, I'm Kate. I'm Robin. Um, we're designers at Endless and we want to talk to you really quickly about um, Endless's 
relationship with GNOME, what it looks like to talk to real users, our users, and a couple of projects that are relevant that Robin and I have been working on at Endless. So, uh, first I want to say that um, it makes a lot of sense that GNOME and Endless are collaborating. We share a lot of the same values, goals, and principles. And one of the principles and values that has come up a couple times today is that um, no mention that uh, we take responsibility for our users' experience. And as designers at Endless, um, one of our guiding principle it principles is that we exist for our users. So uh, we try to understand our users' needs, challenges, and design user experiences that uh, make um, make use of the operating system uh, as useful as possible and provide them with learning opportunities that open doors. Um, so something important to consider about Endless is that a lot of our users are first-time computer users. Um, this is come up in my mind a lot today as we've been listening to people talk about ethics and principles when it comes to building open source software. Um, what does it mean to build uh, an operating system for a first time user? What paradigms are we assuming that they know or don't know? Um, what are we assuming about them at all? Uh, we provide a lot of content for them. Are we making sure that we're not curating too much of that content, that we're sourcing lots of people to contribute to the system? Uh, I could go on and on with questions, um, but there are a lot of ethical implications that are really, really interesting that come into play here. One of the cool projects that I've had the opportunity to work on and collaborate with the GNOME design team with um, has been um, the Endless App Center and the GNOME software um, store. And uh, the App Center is a space where um, we aim to help users discover the great content that we've made available for them, um, which includes education content and tools to help them work and play. Um, so this is the first version of Endless's App Center. Um, it was based on early assumptions from studies in the field. And uh, after spending some time with it and watching our users work with it, um, we learned that some of the challenges were it, the interaction wasn't fully understood by the users. Um, it is also a custom-built experience by Endless, which made it difficult and expensive to maintain. And uh, being a custom-built environment, it also limited our ability to take advantage of new technologies that were coming up, like Flatpak. Uh, so we embarked on a really awesome journey of collaboration, exploration, and iteration with the GNOME design team, where, um, I don't have to look at too many details, but we went through many iterations of wireframes, mock-ups, experiments, and as you can see, there were hundreds and hundreds of ideas and designs generated before we arrived at um, what is our current implementation. Um, and even with this current implementation, we are continuing to learn and try to improve the experience to make it um, easier and the content more discoverable. So we have our current design, and based on new understandings, we have the new designs that are in the works as we speak. Um, and from those designs, we're going to learn what, um, what we can do better in the future. Um, something I've been working a bit on on the design side is the modular framework. Um, Philip, who is up there, would be great to talk to you about this. Uh, and this will, it's basically a sort of building blocks that will allow anyone to build a flat pack app uh, on GTK for Endless. Um, and so I've been working on like making sure the base theming for the SDK is there. Um, and to explain a little bit more of the design system behind the framework, um, there's a really cool article. I put the link at the bottom of the slide. It's on atomic design, and it's the idea that interfaces are made up of smaller components. And so like I said earlier, um, the entire modular framework is uh, building blocks that one can use to make an app. And so if someone were to just throw a bunch of modules together, we need to make sure that it would look generally okay, and then they would be able to build on that for their own needs. Um, and then continuing on 
uh, keeping our users centered. Um, we improve apps con constantly. We figured out that they couldn't read the cards, so we made them bigger. Um, we are constantly tweaking our UI to make sure it's as usable as possible. Um, yeah, if you have any more questions, we're around. Talk to us. Thank Thanks you. so much.